what's going on guys I'm gonna give a little talk I figured I jump on here real quick I had an idea <clears throat> and ideas are amazing things to have Let's see if I can get some more light on the situation well that'll certainly do it <laughs> so there have been a couple of things that kind of come together uh, yesterday there's been a thought running through my mind that's 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 been fascinating to me. It's the us against them scenario. And I posted it online the other day and got quite a few comments on it. Uh, people put the Texas Revolution, World War II versus Japan, and everybody perceived it from one point of view. But in the World War II versus Japan, Japan decided that we were the enemy, so they struck first. And what happened to them? In uh, World War II, you know, Hitler decided the Jews were the enemy. And then now look at them today, where they have a, they have their own, they have Israel. Uh, and Hitler ended up losing. The Texas Revolution, the Mexicans decided that Texas, you know, was a problem. We're going to take care of that. They ended up losing. <laughs> there is, if you look at every scenario like that, and it becomes us against them, what you will inevitably find as you break it down, as it builds up a head of steam to, to, uh, become an action, you will find people picking that low-hanging fruit and they will use it to create a mindset where that person over there is the bad guy. We've got to do something about it. We simply must. In a small group setting, you have the occurrence of the My Lai Massacre. So you have this squad, this patrol, that uh, finally, you know, they've been convinced that the, that the gook is the enemy that the, uh, the Viet Cong are the horrible things, and uh, they're going to take them out. And pretty soon it begins to boil into an idea that all Vietnamese are bad. So they go into this village in My Lai. They, uh, <coughs> they, uh, they lose a soldier, I believe, to a booby trap or a sniper or something, and they kill the entire village. Men, women, and children, they kill all of them. That... that idea of us against them that that people will use that don't necessarily have a secure footing with who they are or what they're supposed to be doing will almost always yield a result of what people refer to as a group evil the british were seriously frustrated with the american colonists they were considered them outlaws and bad people and of course they shipped their outlaws over here for who knows how long georgia was a prison colony <coughs> They decided, well, we'll raise the taxes and we'll crush them. We'll handle this problem as it is. And they ended up losing the war. Everyone looks at it from our point of view, from one person's point of view, where might makes right. and does most of the time. When you take a look at the us against them mentality, it is one of those things that you can use to get a couple of people to your side to make you feel like you're right about a situation. But it doesn't ever necessarily result in the kind of action that will move you forward in life. Look at the African American who's convinced the white man's holding him down. Look at the fear generated by the Democrats and the Republicans <coughs> about this or that issue. And they keep men divided and they stay in power because of that division. The, um, in um, Milton Friedman's uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Prize winning economist, he wrote <clears throat> he wrote that a president has about nine months to enact all of his campaign promises. Um, and the reason he has about nine months is because there's a political machine that gets to working that uh, generates enough fear, enough us against them mentality, that it puts a stop to everything he promised because people become afraid, I'm going to lose something. I'm not going to gain something. There's going to be something there <laughs> that is going to shorten my quality of life or my ability to live life that I want to. The us against them mentality has its roots in ego. And I gave a talk the other night about it, and people absolutely have the hardest time getting that idea through their head that they are so much more than just the thoughts, their memories of what they've done in life. So, like I said, people go through life thinking, 
I am this, 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 and this because I was a veteran, a businessman. I'm a father. I've uh, I've uh, failed at life. I've written some books. I've <laughs> got some credentials. I've you know I've been ostracized. I've been ridiculed. All of these things people walk around in their heads with this idea. That's their perception of self. That these things that they've done make them who they are. <laughs> and yet, not one of those things changes the color of their eyes. It changes the color of their hair or anything else about their being. Now, granted, if you want to go work out, if you want to go train, you want to develop your body, yes, you're taking action to become something more. <laughs> that also gives you a sense of self. I am better than so-and-so because I can bench press this much or I can bench press that much. It's kind of interesting because those all tie together and then we come up with this idea that American psychologists have decided that masculinity is toxic. And I read that article, and they make some valid points. Of course, they put the weirdest aspect of, of some dude wearing makeup that it might be, that might be the, the desired state of masculinity. But the point of it is, is that men are going through life trying to deal with being a man in a world that no longer has any way to teach a man to be a man. If you watch Chuck Palahniuk's uh, interview on Joe Rogan, <clears throat> he points out quite succinctly that the two pieces of great American literature that guide men through this world are Dead Poet Society and Fight Club, two radically different ex examples of how to be a man in this world. Men are expected to go through life with a stiff upper lip. They're expected to try to be a man. Um, um, and it flies in the face of, you know, if you talk about it, if you shed a tear, if you express some kind of doubt, if you if you fail to live up to the idea of being a man that your father that you think your father expects you to be, and you fail at it, what do you do with that? Where do you go with that? How do you become a man in a society that doesn't value masculinity? More importantly, doesn't understand what it's supposed to contribute anymore. We don't have to go hunting and kill anything. We can go to the store and enjoy a feast. <coughs> So they label it toxic because they don't understand it. They don't see how men are supposed to be moving forward in this world. And Joseph Campbell points out, and they mentioned it in that interview, that, that when a man leaves home, everyone always points out that the woman you know, gives her son a homespun garment. And one of the transitions for him to become a man is when he sheds that homespun, homespun garment and dons the armor of the warrior to go out and slay his own dragon, so to speak. But there's also another process involved in that. When a man leaves home, when a boy leaves home, and he begins this process, this journey into masculinity, uh, he, also, he also bonds with someone else. He learns a trade. He becomes an apprentice. He becomes a soldier. And there'll be, there'll be senior NCOs. There'll be men teaching him how to do this and how to do that. <coughs> but we don't necessarily have that anymore. We go to college. And we, uh, some of us will go to the army and we'll make that transition a little bit better than others as far as cutting those ties that bind us to the home. Uh, but just simply going and getting a job and starting a nine to five, that's no longer gilding us uh, that idea of masculinity to help men become men. Sure, we might grow up, but then we'll get trapped in this idea of buying things. I've got a bigger truck. I've got a nicer set of guns. I've got this. I've got that. <laughs> and then... Failing to understand this development of being men, we begin to engage in this mindset that boosts our perception of who we are without ever having done anything to achieve anything. And the easiest way to do that is to gravitate towards something that may or may have not been successful in the past and grab a hold of that us against them mentality. You see it with unions when you have the employees against the upper management. Management becomes the bad guy. And the unions, well, we deserve just as much because we make this company run, but now we see GM going under because of it. <coughs> there's, a, there's a very interesting dynamic handling all of that stuff. So when I put that post up about us against them, I was looking to see if anyone else saw this dynamic happening that men are not being allowed to become men in this society. <clears throat> when, when men do try to find that mentor, that coach, that sensei, 
um, you see him gravitate towards people like Tony Robbins. Uh, it's the success that um, that uh, Chris Jocchio is having, that uh, Master Chim is having, that Paul Wagner's having, that I'm having, that Matt's having. Although I will say that the, <laughs> the demographic, <laughs> I'm the son of a bitch that told your mothers it's okay to go out and be men. Don't forget that because the, the largest dynamic of people that listen to my stuff are women ages 45 to 55. So <laughs> y'all owe me a big debt. You're welcome. <laughs> but being a, being a man is one of those things that when you do leave home and you're not under your father's roof anymore, you've got to learn your way in the world. And usually that involves other men conferring masculinity upon you. What happens if you go out in the world and fall on your face? What happens if you go out in the world and there's not another man around you? Everybody's in church trying to be the nice guy. We will just all be nice guys. Fucking that. Nice guy. I just Look, it's okay to be kind, but that, that unfailing commitment to being the nice guy <laughs> flies in the face of what we were built for. I mean, physically developed and evolved to do. We're not here to be the nice guy all the time. So we, we find some kind of mentor. But if we're in a place where we look around and we don't see anyone that's worthy of being our mentor or might contribute to what we want to become, people will automatically gravitate towards picking that low-hanging fruit. They will pick that path they think will give them the easiest path forward in life where they don't really have to change a whole lot about themselves. And worse yet, if they can engage in a little righteous indignation, well, it makes it all the more easier. Now they've got some real fuel feeding that fire. Now they've got some real anger and frustration and hate to, to really work on and manifest. And they can fly in the face of societal standards. And they can get that shock value and show everybody how much of a man they really are. <laughs> you see a lot of it with, um, with people that, that, that adhere to Hitler's ideas. You see a lot of that. They, they get in a situation where they, they can't really find someone uh, suitable to mentor them. They find ancient idea of a man who's created an idea of us against them and built this magnificent state, this powerful war machine, and the enemy that he finally pointed out is the one that finally conquered him. And that's a painful realization. And yet when we subscribe to that easier, softer path, when we subscribe to those ideas that righteous indignation might really give us the fuel we need, when we begin to buy into the idea of us against them, instead of focusing on getting rid of those ideas that we all think make us better than the next guy and building something worth saving. See, that's the problem with us against them is we're all focused all of our attention on something outside of ourselves and we haven't built a single thing in our home worth fighting to defend. I know people right now that will go out and die for some ancient idea, <laughs> but they don't have anything in their home worth saving. Are their children learning how to become men by embracing an idea of us against them? Yep. Is that going to help them adopt the ideas of masculinity or femininity as they grow up? Is that going to help them create a future that's worth defending? Anybody can create an enemy. I can enjoy a ton of success right now if I jumped out here, excuse me, and decided that there was some group of people or some organization that I wanted to hate. I could rail all day long about the lunacy of universalist ideas. I could gingerly point out that, that failed political systems, social ideologies, and liberal democrats are the poison in the well for the future of generations. <laughs> I could generate a large following doing that. That's low-hanging fruit. and It doesn't go anywhere. It's an absolute shitstorm every time you take a look at it. Go look at any of those social media pages and make a comment contrary to what the popular opinion is. And they will attack you with everything they have. I saw one today. A guy come on there and, and uh, pointed out a real solid fact. <laughs> Some guy thoroughly entrenched in the idea that his us against them mentality created the mindset that made him worthwhile in life, though he's probably never done anything to gain it, uh, went through the guy's profile and find out that he liked Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was a musical genius. Hey, the, the numbers speak for themselves. He may have been a freak in life, weird cat, just 
completely wrong in every aspect, but he knew how to make a beat. He knew how to sell a song. He was successful in every regard in that aspect. <laughs> when are we going to start committing ourselves to being successful in every aspect of our lives like that? When are we going to quit grabbing hold of low-hanging fruit? When are we going to realize that when Odin goes to confront Bathruthnir, this giant that thinks he knows everything, he is going to clear out this idea that is stopping people from grabbing a hold of, utilizing, and making most of the three of the gifts we were given at the beginning of time that every baby receives when they come into this world, so we might join them at the table. So we might justify a seat at the table. <coughs> when Loki goes up there and raises Cain with everybody at the table, pointing out this, that, and you're wrong in this aspect, and you did this, and you did that, and... Um, it's all because he doesn't understand that aspect of the divine. He has grabbed on and gravitated towards an us-against-them mentality. It's me against them. They hate me. I'm going to go show them what I can do. All he does is go off and breed the monsters which destroy the world. And that's kind of what happens in respects to our thinking process when we gravitate towards that us-against-them. If we cannot recognize how when people sit down and decide that this group, this organization, this bunch of people have decided uh, we're going to focus all of our efforts on being against that. That's why you never see universalist groups succeed. They're focused on hating the AFA or somebody else. They're focused on being against that idea. Be against it all you want. <coughs> all you're doing is putting a lot of your energy, a lot of your spiritual, emotional, and mental energy into something that you absolutely hate. And it's going to grow into something in your life. That thing which you think about the most is probably what's going to show up on your doorstep to screw up your day. So when you change your thoughts, you change your reality. When you change your thoughts to not worrying about what they're doing over there and taking care of your own house, now all of a sudden your life begins to get a lot better. <laughs> People are conditioned to constantly, we're programmed every time the nightly news comes on to constantly think about all the negative. Why do we need to be aware of the fact that three people got murdered over in North Tulsa or Chicago or, you know, what does that do for my life? It gives me a little programming to make sure that I intensely dislike or hate something going on over there. But it doesn't build anything in my home doesn't do a damn thing about making my life better. But it does feed my righteous indignation. It does generate profits for the news station because it gives me something, some low-hanging fruit, so I never really have to move past the bottom branches of the tree to keep moving up. I can just hang out down here. There's plenty to feed on, and I can just move through life until I die and then look back and realize I never accomplished anything. All I ever did was hate this or hate that. I never had the courage to find a mentor that challenged me to become something more. I never willingly accepted the challenge of saying, hey, what he's saying might be right. Yeah, that means I'm going to have to change something. That means I might have to get rid of some kind of asinine idea that the best part of me might be realized if I hate something over here. What a shallow idea. Are we? Do you think any of us are going to move any of this forward if we continue to embrace that kind of ideology? <laughs> the whole reason I stick around with the AFA, Matt is a good, close, personal friend of mine. The idea we're going to build something based on who we are, not on what anybody else is doing, not what anybody else hates. We could care. There's a lot of work to do within our community when you see men running around dressed as women, sporting tits, and everything else. There's something wrong there because like that article said masculinity being toxic <coughs> they don't even understand what it is anymore we can't begin to embrace it everybody's trying to be the nice guy or the flip side of the coin they're trying to hate anything which they see as degenerate oh who gave us that authority what's our home look like when are we going to be pointing that finger at ourselves and say, I need to hold my own feet to the carpet or hold my own feet to the fire when I get called onto the carpet and say, I've done this, 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 and this to ensure that 
these children that I've brought into this world, this life that I've been gifted with from wherever they may originate, um, I've done my best to make sure that when they grow up, they're more than willing, more than capable to handle the challenges placed in front of them, not shirk away from them, not subscribe to some failed ideology, not stick around feasting on low-hanging fruit and become nothing in life, that they've jumped up to become something that has what it takes, the strength of spine, the strong back, the mental fortitude, the courageous heart, to grab a hold of an idea, go out there and continue to build and develop your body, and be what you're supposed to become. When you're like that article on Masculinity Suggest, these men are going out here working their 9 to 5 job. <laughs> their masculinity is masquerading as hate or something else. The quality of the men that they think they are revolves entirely around how much they hate some political system, liberal democrat or conservative republican or alt-right or antifa or something. Their ideas of masculinity are masquerading as hating something else. You're goddamn right that's toxic. That is not masculinity. You can sit there and hate, talk about it online all day long. Go out there and get in a fist fight and see how you do. You're not going to talk. You might be able to talk your way out of it. And you're going to hate yourself for not picking yourself up and throwing a blow. Yeah, you might take a whipping. Get up and try it again. That's being a man. Taking care of your household. Making sure your daughters are safe. Making sure your daughters grow up valuing who they are because of your interaction with a man that is present and aware and talking to them as they become women. Not teaching them how, well, you know, you gotta, you blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that probably is not very healthy for us. And when a young man can't get that vital response or support for his own becoming of a man, and he sees the attention that women get, uh, he might try to incorporate masculinity into his life in the way that he sees the other people around him doing. If you want to draw the attention of men, Women do it better than anything else. And those men that are dealing in that lifestyle right now probably never once got the idea, yes, you're man enough. He was probably a nice guy. It's okay. Be okay. I accept you. Bullshit. Grow up. Quit working on low-hanging fruit. Quit taking the path of least resistance. Also true is about taking what's in here and making the most out of it. Not waiting on something out there to determine the quality of our existence. We cannot substitute political ideas or low-hanging fruit or the uh, attention we see others getting because we are afraid to go out and take a risk. That's not why we have these strong arms and strong hands and keen minds. To pick low-hanging fruit? No. We have the strength in our legs to move across the surface of this world and become something more. <coughs> so yeah, we're, you, when you look at it in that perspective, it really is the stunning realization that this way of life, this also true, all these other tribal indigenous pagan faiths that are coming back into the world, how did they all of a sudden become the stalwart, the, the, the bulwarks against the chaos at the edges of society and again begin to represent those conservative values, those family values and traditions that are so important for us to literally create that august thought process and true nautical standard that the world is in dire need of. I will tell you this, <laughs> that as soon as they get done screwing around in the desert with each other, and they realize that while they were over there beating the senses, beating the, the, beating the snot out of each other, there is, they're going to figure out that there's a better us against them scenario for them to engage in and that is hating the pagan. That's just the way it has always worked in the world. Because it's a threat to their ability to pick low-hanging fruit and motivate masses of people with a very simple us-against-them mentality. Now, when that's turned on us, are we going to have the kind of homes where our children might step forth from each day as powerful, confident individuals? Where our wives and us as men might walk forward as powerful, confident individuals and not be afraid of that, uh, that, that glare that we're going to get as we walk down the street. 
walking down the street while people glare at you because you've decided to become a different faith. <laughs> it's not going to be lessened to anybody because you hate someone else. We've got to figure this out. We've got to figure this out, and it's not going to be an easy task. And it's going to require men to stand up and be men and take that more difficult path and create that home where your daughters and your wives and your sisters and your mothers uh, are in a place where they might be allowed to express the beauty of who and what they are. That's our challenge right there. That's what it's all about. You're not going to control that woman. I, there ain't, I ain't never seen a man control a woman. If you create a place where she's safe and can express herself, she's going to love you. If you create an environment where she has to be afraid of your of your wrath, of how much you dislike that, and if she disagrees with you, you're going to blah, 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 raise hell for the next four hours and make her life a living hell. Is that being a man? My father never figured it out. I've had hell figuring it out. And I'm still working on it. Create that environment. That's all responsibility. It's always been our responsibility. Not to dress up as a woman so we might get some attention for ourselves and feel justified in who and what we think we are so we don't really have to work on becoming men, so we don't have to accept the risk of creating an environment where these women in our lives might feel safe, where other men might look at us and say, he's doing a good job. Because it's other men saying that to other men that are going to confer and build masculinity in each other. Not that toxic nonsense these psychotherapists are talking about. But the idea of really being a man, you're going to have to be strong, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. You might have to make some decisions and say, well, that's, that's hurting me. I probably need to stop doing that. That's why I quit smoking. And it's not been the most wonderful thing, but by gosh, it's essential for me to grow, for me to raise children in this world that don't go out there handicapped by their own behaviors as soon as they walk out the front door. That's part of being a man. Um, anyway, I was asked about my thoughts on that toxic masculinity article, and, and that's them. Um, we've got some serious things to do, picking the low-hanging fruit to generate righteous indignation against anyone else isn't going to do it. So, while I may not agree with everybody around me, um, if they're doing those kinds of things that I think men ought to be doing, building a home and, 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 and taking care of those around them with uh, love and strength uh, and competing with the men that are with them to be as good as they are. Um, that's what it's all about. Culture of the Teuton speaks about it very clearly. Anytime they went to war, the, ch the chieftain or the prince got out there and fought as hard as he could, and every man in his unit did his best to outdo the chief or prince. That's what it's all about. <laughs> That's why I love my time in the Army. It was a heyday of competition. Of trying to do it faster, stronger, quicker, more accurately than the guy next to you. That results in one of those amazing fighting forces. We literally have troops all over the world. Some days I wish we'd just call it an empire and tax the rest of the world and pay for everything we want. But <laughs> Ain't that a terrifying thought? But I digress. When we want to move up the tree... When we want to commit ourselves to those thoughts that the eagle with the hawk on his nose represent, instead of hanging around down at the roots where the dragon gnaws on the foundation of our belief in ourselves, and there's a thousand poisonous thoughts that run through our head every day that we, uh, for some reason, can't seem to get rid of, which we need to start doing, um, we're going to have to stop subscribing to those simple ideas uh, of righteous indignation. You can dislike all kinds of things. The best thing you can do to combat any of it is to create an environment in your own home where the beauty of who and what we are as a people uh, is expressed to its greatest extent. And that means success. That means, yeah, we may not like some of the things we got to do, but let's go out there and do them anyway and see if we can be successful. So when somebody's reading your eulogy or somebody looks at that dash between the dates on your tombstone, they realize that that encompasses a magnificent journey of a good man. That's the best legacy we could ever leave our children. Because it's our children that are going to bring this thing to fruition. It may not necessarily be us. Very few times in history has that ever happened. But if we do it right, 
we do have a future for our children. That's what we want. Thanks for joining me.